Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you're able to tune in to the latest episode of the A Few of My Favorite Things podcast. Joining me for the episode today is someone that I've just absolutely loved engaging with, just like all of my other guests this season. But you know, uh, the thing about it is just like a previous guest earlier this season, Thomas is actually from a part of the country that I um, also had some familiarity with, kind of like with May Lynn Dye from the second episode of the season. She is, he, my guest today is also from the great state of Alabama. And joining me for the episode today, I have Thomas Wright. And Thomas, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Garrett. Hope everybody on the other end is doing well as well. Hey, that's, uh, uh, we are doing well. Um, for me, the semester has been over for just a little bit, just a little bit over a week. Um, it's kind of nice trying to relearn what relaxation is because <laughs> it's become so foreign to me. It's not even funny. But if I'm not mistaken, you don't have too much longer until you get to know what that means again yourself. Amen to that. Yes, we have one more week of classes, which is pretty much just the wrap up exams and everything should be done with a nice little bow tie and over. So, hey, I can understand that. And just as a point of reference to our audience, this episode is being recorded on May 7th, 2021. And speaking of which, that actually happens to be one of my cousin's birthday today. So, uh, Ella, if you're listening to this, happy birthday, <laughs> or I guess happy it'll be... Birthday belated birthday technically, but hey, still wanted to think of you. Hope you're enjoying that book I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess going to our conversation for today, it's going to be over a topic that we are both very passionate about, and that is religion. So with your institution now that is associated with the Church of the Highlands, and it's mm -hmm. known as Highlands College. So mm -hmm. can you please tell the audience just a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, it's always been the heart of Pastor Chris, who is the lead pastor of Church of the Highlands, to develop young leaders that they might go out into the field of ministry and do the, you know, do what we're called to do for Jesus in a way of, of just bringing people to know him better. And so through, through his experience, through his leadership and, and working with people, he's helped start... Um, the institution now known as Highlands College, from literally starting in somebody's basement growing up and growing up until now it's a, literally a small college of several hundred people all learning about the heart of God and how to find walk in our callings, whether that be worship or whether that be pastoral leadership or whether that be creative like technical arts kind of thing. That's, that's what Highlands College exists to do, is just equip and empower us young people to go and be the next generation of leaders that will serve the body of Christ. Of course, and I just find that really interesting. I've heard of churches actually establishing schools, you know, elementary, middle school, and high schools, but this is probably the first instance of a church directly establishing a college. So when I initially found out about Highlands College, I actually found that really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's they're definitely pioneering quite a bit of stuff. Like it's, there's no, there's no handbook. There's no guidebook. And especially with the fun wrench of, you know, our president who's never run a college before and has built one from the ground up is now having to run it in a pandemic. And he still like made that work. Good on you, Mark Pettis. <laughs> yeah, that is something that is uh, definitely admirable. And I know this is your first year or basically wrapping up your first year at Highland. So, what have you enjoyed most about that experience? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, let's see. I would have to say, can I do two things? If I keep of them course, short? of course. Uh, um, the first one, just as a college itself, the most notable thing about this whole program, this whole institution, is that everything feels like a family. Like the, the sense of community and family is so strong here that it's like, it's no other, no other college has this. I can guarantee you. I, how big or small they are, I, it doesn't matter. No other college has something like that. Like this is a, 
and I don't mean to boast when I say this, but there, this, this college is really a bit of a miracle in the way that it does that and leads that culture. Um, now, the second thing more specifically though, is because I'm in the outreach practicum, which is like the, the track that Highlands College has for people to more specifically go into a different type of ministry than like running a church. Um, so in the outreach ministry, it's crazy to see how much the, like the, mm, how do I put this? I just keep getting blown away by how much I thought I understood kind of what we are to do with the gospel. Um, and this prac is showing me like this, these classes that are specific to outreach are showing me how much I don't know. And it's, it's really been rocking my world. So love that. Man, that's great to hear. And I can definitely tell that you are enjoying this process. It, it's beautiful to see. <laughs> and, you know, just another thing as well, something I just have in mind is, since it is associated with the, the church, how would you say those experiences with the college and the church just intermingle together? Um, I would say, so we currently don't have like a specific campus or a building that we meet in yeah. so right now we actually meet in across the campuses of church of highlands a couple of the local birmingham ones so like actually where i'm sitting right now this is one of the rooms in our graystone campus which is where we'll have some of our classes and then another one of our campuses is the grandview campus so we'll have some classes there um, and then the grants mill campus will occasionally have classes there that's that's a little rare but so we, we still, we use their buildings and stuff like that. And they just, they flip some of the rooms. We'll use those as classrooms. And then we'll join along and serve alongside the existing teams in whatever church events are going on at respective campuses. So a big part of the college is getting practical ministry experience. You're going to, you're going to get hands on with the stuff you're learning. And so we do that through helping our specific Highlands campuses. So that's kind of how they, that's kind of how they mesh together. It's, it's pretty intertwined, which is cool. So. Hey, that is very interesting. I must admit indeed. And for you, what was the thing that drew you to go to Highlands College? So I actually attended UAB for a year and a half before coming here. And later in my first semester had a dramatic encounter with God, um, just a moment where panic and anxiety had me like frozen in fear on my bed. And I kid you not, God touched me some, I don't still don't know how like that works, but he did. And like in that second, all of that was gone. And so from, from that moment on, I noticed God was like, shifting my passion from doing genetics, which is what I was at UAB for, to, hang on, this ministry thing, this is kind of like, whoa, this is awesome. So as my passions shifted, I was paying, you know, still doing well, but paying less attention to staying around at UAB and looking more towards, okay, where might he be, where might he be pointing me to go? And so after about a year of waiting, um, Highlands College was clarified as the next step. So here we are. And just through that process, um, would you say, has there been anything that you've regretted at all with the transition? Has there been anything that's been difficult for you? Ooh, regrets? I would have to say that I didn't spend more of my time telling people about Jesus at UAB. Hmm. That's that is my biggest regret. And then my difficulties. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like saying, is the painting made with colors kind of thing? Like, yeah, there's, there's challenges left and right. Um, we were almost moving in to my apartment and the, the van we're using, the radiator, just so happens to leak out all the coolant. <laughs> like miles away. We, we're almost there and it drops all the coolant. Um, you know, there's been hard moments where I don't know, I've had a question whether or not I'm supposed to be here because it's just like, 
is it supposed to be this difficult, God? But you just keep going. So, sorry, you are about to say something. Oh, you're good. I just kind of have two points with that. The first one is, I'm a little surprised to say that you're regretful of the fact that you didn't lead more people to God while you're at UAB, which is the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Because if I'm not mistaken, you actually led a church group of other college students associated with Church of the Highlands. So can you elaborate on what you mean by that just a little bit more? Yeah, that's a, I mean, yeah, I led that. So we have at Church of the Highlands what we call small groups, which are intentionally designed to be you know, regularly set up like, hey, let's be friends. Let's get together and do something fun. It doesn't have to be about Jesus. It doesn't have to be about anything in particular. It's just people getting together around a thing they have in common. So it could be tennis, it could be basket weaving, it could be underwater welding. It's whatever you really feel like. And so I led a small group while I was at UAB um, but the reason that doesn't erase my regret when I think about that small group is because that small group served people that were already believers. I wasn't, I wasn't reaching out to people who didn't know Jesus. And one of the, the most impactful things I've learned here at Highlands College is there are, there are several thousand international students at UAB, people that have come from completely different countries to go to school there and 80 percent of those students will never be invited into a home that is not their dorm room while they're here in the u.s and that just that just breaks my heart it's like these people are here in our country what better chance do we have to show them the love of jesus and we just leave them over there. You know, there's still that, that, that rift we leave between the, them and us. Like there's a separation that's, and I didn't cross that gap, even though it was perfectly easy to. I, so I regret that. Let's see. Um, this is the second part of my question as well is it kind of in a way relates to my own experience because like you, I actually transferred as well. Um, it might be kind of confusing to see how did a, guy who goes to the University of Southern Mississippi interact with someone who goes to college in Central Alabama. Well, the thing was, uh, for our listeners who don't know or don't remember, I actually went to Samford for my first year of college, uh, for my freshman year of college. And we actually, I actually met Thomas at, a, uh, at an event associated with Church of the Highlands. And mm -hmm. essentially, we kind of in, in continue with dialogue from there. But essentially, just due to a lot of different factors, I ended up transferring. So that's just for elaboration, everybody. That's how we knew each other. We knew each other. We met each other through a, a church group, essentially, which mm -hmm. was located in Birmingham. And both UAB and Sanford are located in the Birmingham area. But um, with the transfer aspect of that, um, mm -hmm. was there ever a period, and I don't think you hinted to this just a moment ago, where you felt like transferring was something that was rushed, was something that was a mistake, or even better yet, did you feel like dropping out of UAB before you transferred over to yeah. Church of the Highlands was something that kind of scared you a little bit? <laughs> That's a fun question. Um, so there was a particular moment not too long after I had that really powerful encounter with God. Um, there was another one later on where... I believe God revealed to me where, where he wants me later in life, kind of like the purpose for my life. Um, and so right after that moment, you know, it was another kind of similar experience where just something crazy happened. And it's like, I felt like my insides flew up in the air and then fell right back down and my feet never moved. It was just kind of fun. Um, and so right after that moment, I, I went back to my my dorm room and called my mom and said, all right, mom, I think it's time to leave UAB. God's, God's telling me to go somewhere else. And so there wasn't, once I knew there wasn't hes like hesitation in my part as far as it was like, okay, got to move now. It's clear that he said it's time to go. Um, but thankfully, mama knows best. And she said, hang on, slow down. <laughs> what just happened? because I haven't talked to you in like a week. And um, 
she advised me to wait it out and just take time to you know, pray through this, like see, okay, is this really, like be sure about this before you just jump into something different. And so it took an entire year from that moment to really go forward with the transfer process. But when it was time to leave UAB, you know, we, we finalized, me and my family finalized the decision on a Sunday. And then by Wednesday, I was completely withdrawn from the school. Everything moved out of my apartment and living back home. So when it was the right time, it happened like that. But when it wasn't the right time, it was the period of, it was that season of waiting. So that was, that was interesting to walk through because you don't always expect that. You don't always expect God to tell you, hey, this is what you're going to do. Now wait 365 days. <laughs> Now that's a very interesting point and kind of going off of the element of surprise. I remember when you told me that you transferred, I, I have to admit, I was, I was extremely surprised. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I can understand what you mean by that. But um, just based off of what you've said and just kind of looking in things in retrospect, I can tell that you've definitely made the right decision for yourself and for your life. So uh, I don't see any regret in your eyes or in your demeanor at all. <laughs> Well, thank you, Garrett. I appreciate that. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. If you have not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, I hope that you will go ahead and subscribe. And also, if you have not watched the previous episodes of the A Few of My Favorite Things podcast this season, please be sure to do that as well. You can look at the podcast episodes on home, or you can just go to playlist, click on the A Few of My Favorite Things podcast playlist, and just watch all of them, or just watch the ones that you've missed so far. We only have one more episode planned after this one. It's going to be a great season finale, just like the season finale for last season. I hope that you enjoy that last episode. But before we get there, we have this episode. And just another thing as well is just with the opportunity to just come and just share your story. Obviously, uh, it's very impactful and I, I feel like it's very meaningful as well. And with the audience who's really just comes from a plethora of backgrounds, um, just due to the very nature of the content that's been covered this season, we might have some people who are economics, economists, <laughs> economists. I always mess up that term. We might have some people who are economists listening. We might have people who can even be Muslim listening. You might have people who are car enthusiasts listening, shoes enthusiasts listening, sports fans listening. And, you know, that really brings a lot of things to the table. Also, education of us listening as well. And so with that just melting pot of individuals who have just come on the podcast, listened to previous episodes, we have some people that are going to be left and just looking at your story. What do you want them to take from the process you've been through right here, especially within the last few years? And what do you want them to take them, take from your experience as they have listened to your story thus far? Oh, wow. Mm. As in like, if I, could, if I could give you a diamond, what diamond would I give you kind of thing? Like from, that, from the story that might feel like, at least to me, is like a box full. <laughs> More or less, yes. But it can be more than one diamond if you want it to. Um, I think it's important to remember um, that just a part of my background, because uh, like my story may sound like it just may be interesting or however you see it impactful or whatever um, as it is. But to know to know where I came from before that, I think colors it in a completely unique way. So I grew up in. Alabama all my life, which Alabama, if you're not from here, it's a, it's a very conservative, very religious state. Um, there's, you know, we joke around, but it's kind of true. There's literally a church on pretty much every street corner you go to. It's, especially in Birmingham. Especially in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's a cultural norm to be Christian. And so that, that, makes it interesting so i was born and raised inside of a church um or like just within a church community not literally inside of a church my bet on the wording there um so and so i just i've always grown up around jesus and the knowledge of the bible and, and things like that 
and it, you know, it was great. It taught me basic morals, taught me, you know, the Christian ethics and just how to walk out my life in a good way. And what's funny is that through, because I was, I fully accepted Jesus into my heart at about nine years old. I said I wanted him to be my savior. Um, and even through that process, even through growing up in the church and around, around all of the Jesus knowledge that I could possibly be around, by 19, I still found myself on my bed, weeping, frozen in anxiety over a thing that I didn't think it was possible for me to do. I just wounded two friendships incredibly bad and hurt some people. And I, I was just frozen in that moment. Like, what happened? What what did I do? I followed the, the rules as best I could. I, I you know, I, I'm not, I'm, Garrett will know more, um, more than anyone. I'm, I'm not exactly not a smart person, which I don't mean to brag when I say that, but it's just, it's something about me. I, I can understand things pretty quick. I remember things really well. And so I'm like, what, what did I do wrong? What, that's the thought going through my head. Ah, I'm just freaking out. But then for the first time in my life, in that moment of fear and anxiety, I experienced the person of God and interaction with him in a moment where he moved in my life and changed the circumstances that I was sitting in. He, he took away the noise in my mind, and just, just like a snap, like boom, gone, silence. Immediately when I cried out, I had grown up my whole life before that point, knowing all about who Jesus was, but I didn't ever meet him until I needed him more than anything, until I recognized how much I needed him more than anything. And so that the one thing I would, I would say to you guys to take away more than that is my life isn't possible without a personal relationship with Jesus as crazy as that sounds, it's what he wants for us. That's what the Christian life is all about. It's not about following the rules or doing right and wrong. It's, it's I'm in love with this God of the universe who crazy enough died for me. I'm, I'm madly in love with him because he loved me first. So that would be my encouragement. Of course. And, you know, the thing about relationships as well is, in a way, especially now, just because, you know, and I guess this will kind of go back to what you know about me as well, um, that with this, with this year, just in general, it's been all virtual. And mm -hmm. as a transfer student, that's not necessarily the most ideal of conditions, even if these conditions have technically never happened before. But anyway, right. um, <laughs> it's, it's been hard to socially interact with people mm -hmm. especially new people mm -hmm. and so essentially with the limited opportunity i've had to communicate with people that i've met last year and in the past i still have had a lot of time to myself as well and you know what that's allowed me to do is that's allowed me to really just think back on some relationships think back on some things that i did in the past that especially as really the people that i hadn't really thought of differently up until that point and, you know, it, it got to a point where I realized that, you know what, I think I messed some things up here. Uh, you know what, I should have done this differently. And at the time, I thought that it was either mostly right in what I did or completely right in what I did. And, you know, it's kind of a process of just now you're trying to reach out to people. You're trying to correct what you've done. And even mm -hmm. though your mistakes may have been accidental or not intentional sometimes they were um, for me in, in my case at least what you do is you try to apologize for that and sometimes the person you're trying to reach out to he doesn't either respond or just ignores it and you know that's something that can definitely weigh on you as well because you know it, it takes time to I guess kind of 
think about what you've done and think about your actions. And sometimes it doesn't happen for a while. And, you know, um, it's at times can be a little difficult for me to kind of rectify the fact that what I've done in some ways has affected people negatively. And mm -hmm. it can be difficult to just grapple with the fact that, hey, this person, despite my genuine efforts of trying to come back to them, they, do, they don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that as well that I've also come to understand is I can't blame them for that. You know, I, I can't blame them for the fact that they don't want to talk because based off of how I acted, it's something that I should have done differently at the time. And even though I didn't know better than or, I, or should have known better than but didn't, that's still not necessarily an excuse. And, you know, sitting on that can also be very distressing. Sitting on that can also be something that um, can eat at you. It, it can be something that, that weighs on you because you know that on some level, it, it has hurt people, it has affected relationships. And sometimes when you're looking through the pieces, you, you can wonder how it got to this point. It can feel so sorry that you didn't do something to prevent that or to change that to make things not better but to make things wholesome and just good to begin with and mm -hmm. so with with those emotions you were talking about earlier with being remorseful about those relationships i can completely relate to what you're saying it's very mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. yeah and there's it's a little bit of a journey to walk to walk with God through because it's, hang on, Lord, I, I know I messed this up, but you're still here. You still say, I'm worth being around. You still say, I'm worth dying for. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, it doesn't excuse the fact that, yes, I have messed up and I, and I need, just for the sake of the, the human worth that they have, I ought, to, I ought to try to reach out and extend them love again. And whether they accept it or not, that is their choice. And in a way, it's like, yeah, we'll seek forgiveness. And forgiveness may happen because one of the things that's often a, a, a misunderstanding is the difference between and uh, difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. So forgiveness can happen even though you two aren't friends anymore there can there can be forgiveness and release and just it can be over matters can be settled and your friendship doesn't have to grow anymore reconciliation looks like where it's like okay we're forgiven and we still want to be around each other like our friendship will keep growing and dive into new depths through that and so we can it's important to remember we don't have to have reconciliation all the time that can come should the lord want it and should the other person want it but yeah. more or less find forgiveness yeah um yeah reconciliation is something that is uh can be definitely hard to find and you know it it hurts that you don't get it but you completely understand why and you you own why and the thing is um that's something i've admired about you especially with when you were telling me about what you were referring to just because with uh with with reconciliation um that's that's something that we, in a perfect world everyone forgive each other and we'd all grow mm -hmm. up and we'd all yeah. learn from our mistakes but oftentimes even when that's granted that doesn't necessarily happen and so mm -hmm. we're obviously not the only people that we did they've dealt with and so oftentimes there can be reasons why they don't you know, maybe they've had bad experiences when they've given people reconciliation and they don't want to go back and expose themselves to being potentially hurt again. Yeah. And obviously there's a plethora of other reasons, but uh, right. I guess what comes is just an understanding that um, that's, that's just part of it. It's not necessarily what you want to hear. That's not necessarily what sounds amazing or the, I guess, the fairy tale ending of sorts, but it's just reality right. yeah it's it's one of the bitter more more bitter parts of, of things for sure it is 
but acknowledging that is what's very important mm -hmm. and doing your part to reach out to those individuals mm -hmm. to try to ask for genuine forgiveness that's important because what can easily happen is one can just just pray to god for forgiveness about what happened in that situation and that that can be good but what's more important is is to instead ask that person for forgiveness to ask the person who you directly wrong for forgiveness and try to make amends for that person directly mm -hmm. um and I guess it can go to with another theme about praying for things that innately you can one can do themselves instead of trying to push it off onto something else. But ultimately, with um, with that approach, it's definitely uh, a lot harder because <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier to ask uh, for forgiveness or to ask for forgiveness in the in the bedroom instead of in the in the workplace or in the classroom or you know. Mm. in front of that person and telling that person directly so being direct with it is what's go. important it's very true absolutely and i think too you know it's there's a chance that often the, the common culture of this world doesn't even really think about that or especially in just in the regards like you'll you will have people in your life that won't you know they won't pursue reconciliation beyond the forgiveness that beyond the like okay yeah what happened wasn't right but i release you i'm i'm done thinking about it um and i think it's just important to remember at least in the case of christians is why you're doing it and everybody everybody's going to have a different motivation as to why they're they're seeking to forgive somebody or be forgiven but in the case of in the case of christians we at least ought to we ought to pursue forgiveness not just for our sake i mean yes it it releases us and makes life a little less miserable um but more importantly what it demonstrates to that person is the love of jesus it's it that like it displays his affection in a way that that might just cause them to ask questions. It might just, you know, give them something else to pursue instead of, you know, them medicating their problems with things of this world, like, you know, the usual list of sins, uh, drugs, alcohol, sex, things like that. Instead of medicating their problems, they might in that moment, hang on, this is something different. And that, that really hit home for the first time. That really touched my heart for the first time where there's been hurt and what's this new thing is this what jesus does and so that's that's our hope when we pursue forgiveness like that it's, it's not it's not entirely for us yeah very true and you know uh th this is exactly why i enjoy these uh these types of conversations with you it always gets on a, a deep level and uh, just to our audience uh we've definitely had conversations about this and definitely other even more intrinsic and deep things as well and it's always engaging to just partake in that and just to just talk with you on that and ultimately as we close out the show uh, as i do for every guest i want to ask you this is there anything that you feel like needs to be highlighted or another point that you want to just analytically go into before the show ends oh no you better be careful with that question. <laughs> um, the first thing is I just want to thank you for, for having me on the show. It's, it's a privilege to just be able to share my story with, with you and with our audience. It's, it's a privilege to think about you guys, whoever you may be, even though I may never see your face. And I, I just, I hope there was something out of all this that spoke to you. That was a gift to your heart. And, um, as a, as a final note, I would just want to go back and touch on that. Remember that it's real relationship that changes lives, not, not what we commonly call religion, which I know that's the, the title of this episode uh, is, <laughs> is religion, which is okay. It's because it's, it's the framework that everybody really thinks about. Oh, it's, it's like 
faith and stuff like that. They just lump it under religion. Um, and I, I just want to be careful to not get it confused with, with what the purpose of Christianity is. Like, yes, it, it is a faith. It, is, it does have its commandments, its tenets, its beliefs, its worldview and all that. But at the center of it all, it is interacting every day with the person of Jesus who saved my life, not just in one moment, but for all time. So I think that'll wrap it up on my end, at least. <laughs> of course. And it's always just been a pleasure to talk with you as always, Thomas. It really and truly is. And ladies and gentlemen of the audience, I hope that you have enjoyed the conversation as well, listening to Thomas Wright. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, man. And we're going to be talking some more as well going into the future. So Absolutely. thank you so much for joining the show today. It's really appreciated. And as always, thank you, man. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. This is going to be really the last message that I put out. But this is kind of in lieu of the latter theme of this episode, which is just apology and forgiveness. Look, if there was ever a situation or a time when I did something or said something that you felt like was inappropriate, at least on my end, please let me know. And just in advance, I just want to say sorry. If you want to engage in dialogue about that, I'll be more than happy to. Just please let me know. Because even though it is definitely your decision to want to see if you want to pursue that, and if you don't, I understand and I respect that. But if you do, I just want to let you know that you have that option. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I say stuff that ultimately in some regard, especially in retrospect or even in the moment that I regret. I've done things in the retrospect that I regret and sometimes in the moment I regret. And if if there's ever been a situation where you feel like because of me, I've done something that's wrong, you or hurt you, please let me know. Um, I'm not going to come from a place of judgment. I'm not going to come from a place of anger. I want to come from a place of understanding and learn how I can be better. And to some extent, I have tried to reach out. And maybe some of the people listening on right now know that I've tried to reach out. I mean what I say, and please reach out to me. And I mean when I say I'm sorry, I do. Y'all have a good day.